Hey everybody, this is Jason Evangelo, host of Linux for Everyone, and you're listening to the stoolest podcast around, Destination Linux. Welcome to episode 160 of Destination Linux. This is a podcast about using learning and sharing our passion for Linux and open source. So whether you're a beginner or master sudoer, welcome to the show. I'm Ryan, and with me today are the Super Bowl champions of Linux, Michael and Noah. That's right, Chief. There you go. That was a good game. I don't know anything about football, but it seemed like a really good game for what the sport is supposed to be about. Yep. Bo- the Throwing kicking, the ball bowling, stuff. Yeah. through the, the, the uprights and stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. It was great. Well done. Yep. Before we get into the show, uh, we wanted to start this podcast with some news. It's sad news for us and for many of you. You probably have noticed that Zeb has been out for the last few episodes, and he has been taking some time to reflect on the loss of his friend Mark Greaves of Peppermint. Zeb has asked us to share this message in his own words. The loss of Mark Greaves has affected me deeply, more so than I ever realized it could. It is therefore with the deepest regret that I must step down from Destination Linux. I simply cannot fathom appearing live on camera again. I want to thank you all for the amazing times we've had together and for giving me the opportunity to be a part of the greatest podcast in Linux. And I also want to thank our patrons for the support they gave me and continue to give to Destination Linux. I do not intend to disappear off the face of the earth and will continue to troll the stool geek. That must be you, Michael, relentlessly. And remember Ryan, Team Green for the win. I cannot believe he threw that in there. And then he puts this, Noah's simply too cool to troll. What the heck? End quote. So for those who are not aware, Zeb was originally joining the show as a producer behind the scenes, and then he became a part of the, sh- of the show in the host form, which brought all kinds of great stuff. He gave us endless laughs with his uh, quick British wit and stoic nature. So it's it's going to be unfortunate that we're losing him for this, but also he's not leaving the desolation of his community, like he said. He'll be in Telegram discourse and all the other places. It'll be... It's going to be just a different ep- show, but it, he'll still be a part of the community. So that's he'll still be trolling us in text. Isn't he doing his Euro truck thing still? Yeah, he's still doing stuff. But he he doesn't want to be on camera anymore. So his his European yeah. uh, truck simulator stuff is still he's doing off camera stuff, but he's still yeah. doing stuff on his channel for that. In that sense, uh, he also is still trolling us. Like I woke up this morning to him trolling us in the Telegram group. Well, okay, <laughs> trolling me in the Telegram group, but whatever. <laughs> Which so, is what we expect, right? Which is fine. It's it's great. It's it's it shows that he's he's still a part of the community and still continuing to abide by his claims of trolling me. So that's great. Well, <laughs> I have to say, my, my my most disappointed, the most disappointing thing is I never got the opportunity to use the uh, the clapper thing. We uh, we knew we knew we had a good show. We had trolled properly when we could get Zeb to laugh. Oh, yeah. Uh, He brought a lot of maturity to the show. But when we could get him to act immature, that was the greatest moments for me uh, having him on the show. He's going to be greatly missed. He's a good friend. We'll continue to be a great friend uh, through the community. But not having him on this show um, means that we're basically one less person to troll Michael. And that, to me, is the biggest shame. Yeah. And the, the, you know, the truth is, uh, <laughs> okay. the show is probably going to extend by about four and a half hours without the adult in the room to uh, keep us on track. It's not, Agreed. that's, I, I can't disagree with that at all. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's unfortunate we're losing him, but it, we are going to do something that we kind of started with, uh, while his, he was absent for the show, we started having on guest hosts. We're going to be continuing that for a few episodes or perhaps more. So we'll be getting some more guest hosts in the future episodes. Uh, but for now, we're going to be continuing on with only three of the four greatest minds ever discussing our passion for Linux. Uh, join us as we raise our bubbly to Zeb and thank him for being part of our journey. And we two fisting Zeb. I'll two fist you. Okay. Oh, you got the pineapple too. Let me. Throw yeah. My no, this is uh, this is a mango, man. This is okay. a mango. See, oh. we got every flavor represented for you there. <laughs> and yep. uh, we wish we wish you well, Zeb, and may everything be tickety boo. So let's find out what the crew's been up to this week, Michael. What have you been up to? I have been working on setting up a NAS for backing up all the stuff that I do for Destination Linux and This Week in Linux and the rest of the network and everything. And it has been an interesting experience because I typically did the whole manual backups where you have m- multiple drives connected and do a backup and then disconnect them. And now actually having... So two years into the show, now you've decided to back stuff up. 
No, no, I decided to back them up a long time ago. I just didn't turn yeah. it on and use <laughs> it. Making sure. So it's very different. <laughs> I mean, I have it, I've had it for a couple months, and it has been turned on a couple times. But right, actually, you even have that NAS. It's sitting behind him. No, yeah. it's it's not. Like it's over months. here. It's over here. So you can't right, see. He thought it. about yeah. backing up so. the show, but then he was like, it's "Is it really store. worth backing up?" I the kept show? backing it up. It's still backed up. I just didn't back it up efficiently. It's very different. Uh, okay. But I got oh, that wow. settled now, and I'm happy to say that having a NAS is awesome. Uh, and also, I have somewhat solved a. The, the issue with OBS, thanks to Gabmus from uh, Tech Pills, he sent me a message. Well, hold he, on. Back up. What was the issue with OBS? What did you screw up? There was not enough scenes. I was just asking. Oh. There was not enough scenes. Okay. I need to have so at least 700 have... more scenes, and that way okay. it's solved. Okay? Makes okay. sense. And somebody helped you create these other 700 scenes or showed you why you didn't need them? I don't understand. Uh, no, it sh- show, showed me you. how I could put more in. That's what it oh, was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. So really what happened is that there was this issue with OBS where it was some reason there's there's some kind of problem with either the kernel and the Mesa or the Mesa drivers with OBS. So after a certain point, the OBS would start memory leaking and it would leak mm. a lot. So the point where leaked all your scenes out. All yeah, the all, all the scenes just couldn't it it couldn't handle all the amazing scenes that I have. So mm. it started memory leaking, even though the process didn't say it was changing at all, but it started like just increasing the total amount of usage to the point where it starts using swap. And then when it starts using swap, it would then crash when it gets all of swap used. And because I didn't really have, I don't really have that much swap because I don't typically use it. It crashed, you know, often. Uh, so this, the issue <clears throat> was uh, a, pr- a problem that it basically, it doesn't seem like it's fixed at all right now. So there's just what, there's just a overall, it's just a, a now, weird... Did you open a bug report? We tell our users yes. on the show. Well, one, I didn't back open up everything it all the existed. time. And then number two, open bug reports. So do you follow your own advice? So one, yes, I do follow my own advice. However, this one okay. I did not send it because it was already po- it was already posted. Okay, so, so to be clear, you didn't follow your own advice. No, one. because it was already posted. And I just added to it. Said that oh. yes. So I, I, oh. I, I I'm also experiencing this problem. Uh, ho- oh. However, I would uh, I I do think confirmed that confirmed bug affects more than one user. Yes, exactly that kind of thing, yeah. and mm-hmm. I so I but the the great thing about it is that uh, Gabmus told me uh, about uh, that he's been using App Image for the same problem, and the App Image version of OBS doesn't have this problem, so it's hmm. fantastic. So I've been using that for the past couple of episodes, and it has been flawless, no memory leaks. You know, happy to report hey, that let, we're let good. Let me ask you, let me ask you this, Michael and mm-hmm. Ryan. Do you guys ever stay away from either app image or uh, snap packages because it doesn't respect like I've had problems with theming. I've had problems with and, and I get it right when you, anytime you separate, you know, this package from the rest of the operating system, obviously, then the operating system can't make changes to the package. It's the whole idea. But I find myself staying away from the snap package and staying away from the app image because it has sometimes unpredictable behavior as compared to the software that's installed natively on the computer. I mean, so if I'm given a choice, Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the software in a repository first. And then if I can't get that software, for instance, I've been playing a lot with Solus and they've improved what is there in the store, but there's still a lot of things missing. Then I'll go to Flatpak then snap or app image or wherever the software is at. Cause at the end of the day, I just want the software. I don't really care what universal format they use to, but I agree with you that the theming can be off the, you know, sporadic issues with them, different things along those lines are still a problem okay. out there. So I'm not well, the only one dealing with well, that. Well, it, this theming issue is a, is a, is definitely apparent for snaps and sometimes apparent for right. flat packs. I think app images are the, are the best comparison for, for theming. But then people will say they're not secure as snap and flat. Well, well, I mean, they don't have a, they don't have a security confinement structure. That's true. But well, also so, their, here, your system, they're more secure in a way than like dev files and regular repo files, because those app images don't require pseudo. Right. I guess my thing was, and this is kind of the revelation I came to this week when I, when I was dealing with this, I went to install whatever it was and thought I'm not, I can't do that because I can't. And, uh, and I, and I got to a point where I went, wait a minute, if the movement here, the forward direction here is eventually snaps, flat packs, app image, something is going to replace native software. And that's the idea of like how we're going to distribute software and it's going to be available everywhere and updates and blah, 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 blah. If that's going to become the default and the thing that we want everybody to, to work towards then we should probably address some of these underlying issues at some point. And I just, I didn't know if I was the only, if I was just kind of out in la la land and everybody's like, yeah, I don't really care what it looks like. 
or if this is actually a thing and if it's actually a thing is there anybody working on you know can we get this stuff so that it feels like a native app and works like a native app and yeah. respects all the theming but defaults as a native app they're well, this all is kind of what I, I brought up a couple of weeks ago uh in a show where i was asking you know is this now that we have multiple universal packages as well are we going to do what we seem to do a lot in the linux world and have all of our talent split amongst three things that we just keep going indefinitely and nobody picks one so that you don't get issues like that fixed because nobody's focus is in one area, right? You've got some people, half the people wanting flat pack, half the people wanting app images, and your talent is split between all three. Should there be a move in Linux where we say, hey, let's pick one, let's stick yes. with it, and let's go? Look but, at what we did with System D and look where that got us, right? There was a there was a kerfuffle. People didn't understand. Uh, people were going back and forth. People were arguing. That, you know, there was there was a split of resources, and then we all came together and said, "Okay, we're going to center around System D. That's going to be the thing." Ubuntu did it. Debian did it. And now look where we are. Right. Everything is going in a very fluid and 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 solid direction. And the people that were were or, or the same thing can be said about Wayland and uh, and Mir. Right. Look, that's even a better example. Now that I think about it. Not only did we all kind of center around Wayland. Then they went back and took the Mir team and said, okay, well, because Wayland doesn't have its own compositor in there, we'll use Mir as the compositor. Mm -hmm. And now Mir has become a remarkably useful project so that it can support things like Wayland. And so the efforts aren't wasted. Everybody's working on something towards a common goal. And Linux in general is getting better rather than being split. I think we should absolutely do the same thing with packages. I mean, that ideally, yeah, one package format would be the best. But I mean, the, the value of having the different three is that you can see the innovation being done on all, sure. all the different sides. And you can see the value, like there's pros and cons for all of them still. But absolutely, it's good to see that, that you know, one group is testing one thing to find out which one, which security model is a better model and which update mechanism is a better update mechanism. I, I think that they all at the moment have value because we're just kind of, in the process of seeing which one is better and all of them being compatible with each other in terms of not actually breaking because you're using one of them. Like that's a fantastic uh, stopgap between not having a universal format than having a few. So if they were, if there was any conflict, that would be a much bigger problem, but because there isn't a conflict, we don't have to worry as much. And I would also say that snaps and flat packs are definitely working on theming support and I know Flatpaks has done it, uh, you know, they've got farther along in that part. And I, for me, app images have always worked totally fine with themes. I haven't, I can't think of a time where they couldn't, they didn't work. Uh, they have their own issues. Like the update mechanism is not as good. And the, uh, the security confinement stuff is not as good. Like either way that we have, whether we have the three or we have the one, it is still better than the hundreds of form of traditional packages. I am so True, much happy. You still have the that. confusion going on. Now, somebody, uh, some of our patrons are talking about right now that, you know, picking one package would be like only having one desktop environment. You know, I, I, I see that very differently because we're not trying to get vendors to adopt desktop environments. We are trying to get vendors to write their software in Linux. And if you keep confusing, right, you have one, that. one person in Linux coming to you saying, hey, you should make it in a flat pack. Another one, because it's universal package. You have another one saying, no, 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 make it an app image. Then you got the community saying, we hate snaps for whatever reason, or we hate flat packs for whatever reason. And the vendor's going, okay, back to the same problem we have with the hundred different packages. Right. Nobody knows what they want. If and we pick one, they get mad at us. So you know what? We'll just stick and, and here a hundred different distros, right? Like they don't know which right. distro they're targeting, and they don't know which part package format, and they don't know how to do updates, and they don't like it. It, it just becomes a cluster one comes to try with to flat Linux. packs out of the box. To your point, Noah, one comes with snaps out of the box, so they're not hitting every distro. So I really don't think it's like DEs because it's not that critical for a vendor to choose whether they have KDE Plasma or not. It, it's not a big deal. But software for distribution really is a big deal, I think, for what we're trying to accomplish with universal packages, which is, A, you can write one piece of software in one format that everyone in Linux can use regardless. I, I don't know. I just I, mean, I feel like it's just a pipe dream anyways, because it'll never happen. Everybody will we'll probably have four more formats of universal packages before anything well i don't think that's if less anything's going to happen we'll just have more not less i think that i think that we're going to be probably not losing any of the three i think that ideally no one we won't would, lose the three no no no. i'm not i don't mean lose i mean i don't think there's any consolidation and i don't but i don't no. think there's going to be any more because app images were the first format that existed for this purpose 
and then snaps were made and then flat packs were made. But the snaps and flat packs were made basically at the same time within like a couple weeks or so. So like they, they transition between those is it makes sense that they are doing that because one, a couple of them who worked on, I think, I, I think there's a few people who have worked on both formats of Snap and Flatback that never heard of app images. So it was kind of interesting to see that dynamic. But I don't think that because flat packs and snap images, snaps and app images were, exist, there is any need for someone else to try to make another format. So I think we're going to be just using these three from now on. And because there's no conflict, a company can use it. And yeah, they're going to get annoyed by some people, but like that would happen regardless. Even if there was a universal format, there'd be people who want it on their repos and complaining about that. So it there's going to be people complaining because that's just how it is. You know, I don't know. But I think that it's still good that these exist. And I, I think that this is like a massive, massive improvement from the previous thing. Because when I used to do package support for all these different distros, it was a nightmare. So now it's just three packages or you could just pick one of them and it's typically fine, whichever one you pick. So I think this is a great a current like era that we have now for packages. What have you been up to this week? I have been working on a, I've actually been working on the past few weeks, but this week was kind of the, was kind of the home stretch. Um, got some developers involved and got our web people involved and we are working on a new community resource for the Ask Noah show and so it'll be announced on Tuesday and so we're kind of getting all the final little bits and pieces together but um, the you know the the every show on the destination Linux network has has uh, has has its own niche and its own value to the community and one of the things that I've always seen ask Noah is the place where people come to help each other right when people are having trouble with various things or how to do various things. And we've got some of the smartest people that work for, you know, Red Hat and Canonical and some of these other companies that are involved in the community. And so I was, I was working this a few weeks ago, was working with on a, on a client project and needed some help and reached out to the guy at Red Hat who was doing that particular, who was in charge of that particular uh, product. And I was like, man, you know, this is the kind of thing where usually you would go through, you'd have to, you'd have to call Red Hat and then you'd go through their little subscription thing and get the right person involved. And then you'd get a ticket open and a case. Ask. And here it is. I could just talk to the project developer and just ask, you know, what was the thought process behind doing this thing or that thing? And how would you recommend I do it as the person who runs this project? Then he was able to give me this step-by-step. Step, here's how you do it. I thought, man, that's a valuable resource for the community to have that. And um, and so we worked and, and I think we're just about ready. I think we're going to hit our, our target release date of Tuesday. And so more information to come on that. But um, that's what I've been working that's on. Very exciting. I yeah. can't wait to see that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so Ryan, what's new in your world? So this week we recorded another episode of Hardware Addicts. If you have not heard this podcast or of this podcast yet, what are you living under a rock? But no, seriously, uh, Michael, me, and Wendy all do this podcast, and we discuss hardware, and we stay focused on hardware throughout the episode, and there's a lot of things that basically we are calling brain fillers, where we're going deep into lessons and, and learning opportunities with the hardware. So we're not just reading news items or things like that. We're going into the questions people would have in building a computer, overclocking computers, fans, yeah. All of the all of the intricate things behind the scenes from all of our various areas of expertise, and it's been fantastic. The community feedback we've gotten on the two episodes that are out already has been amazing. This week we are talking about cooling solutions. So for all of those who have been interested, and in, should I use a fan? Should I use an all-in-one? Should I use an open loop cooler? We go into all the pluses and minuses of each of those solutions and talk about which options we use, as well as this week, we talk about cameras. So Wendy, obviously, being a professional photographer, it was time that we start getting into the camera hardware as well into the show. So if you're interested in that, check out the new Hardware Addicts podcast. Yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. If you're not even uh, like that familiar with with hardware, it's really interesting for that perspective too. Because he was Ryan just mentioned how we we have our own expertise in related to the show. Uh, except for me, I don't have any in hardware. So that's my position is to uh, be the the lightning rod of learning things as a beginner in the hardware space. And it's really fun. And I ask really silly questions, but turns out they're typically helpful. And so, you know, it's, it, we're going to have, yeah, we have a lot of great content in that, in that show. So be sure to check it out. You can go to hardwareaddicts.org or destinationlinux.network to find more. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by one of my favorite companies on the planet, Digital Ocean. 
DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. And at work, I'm having to work on different cloud project providers out there. And let me just say, DigitalOcean, when they talk about an easy-to-use intuitive API, that is not just a marketing slogan. There is Coming from DigitalOcean and going to being forced to use other providers, you miss DigitalOcean immediately. It is amazing how well their API works in comparison to these other companies out there that are trying to get into this market. DigitalOcean's been there for a long time. You can get all of this stuff we just talked about, plus access to the world-class customer support for just $5 a month. And Michael and I were talking this week about some of those other providers out there and how much it costs just to set up a WordPress site, $35 plus a month. In, in many cases, just to have the same thing they're giving you here for $5 per month. Or if that's not good enough, you can use their flexible pricing structure for as low as 0.7 cents per hour. And that, my friends, is darn near free. DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. You can get started on DigitalOcean for two months free with a $100 credit by going to DO dot co slash dln you're gonna open your browser and type in do dot co slash dln you want to make sure that dln's there so they know that you came from the destination linux network and again we want to thank digital ocean for continuing to sponsor this show and this episode mike writes in and says hello destination linux crew let me start up by thanking each of you for this excellent podcast in my opinion it's the perfect balance of technical information humor and infection passion for Linux. I look forward to each episode and please know how much we appreciate what you do for the Linux community. Now to my question. I'm an engineer. And my tendency is to try to fix things that aren't broken until they actually are. To be specific, I recently broke my Ubuntu 1910 installation on an old 2013 MacBook Pro while trying out a different NVIDIA driver, hoping to get the fractional scaling in GNOME to work properly on Ugh. this machine. Yeah. After rebooting, I was unable to see anything on the screen. My attempts to bring up the TTY also failed. I ended up reinstalling, which actually was fun in its own way. While I didn't mind reinstalling Ubuntu on this non-critical machine, I thought about how much time I'd spend configuring my Raspberry Pi, started to wonder about a backup strategy, and what I should be using to back up my Linux machines going forward. I'm thinking about simply creating a cron job to run a bash script with rsync commands to copy over the data to my NAS, but perhaps there's a better idea. What open source backup options are available for Linux in general and for the Raspberry Pi specifically? I think it would be awesome if I could periodically back up an ISO image on the NAS that I could use to reflash a micro SD card if my Pi ever died. Of course, I guess I could just remove and copy the micro SD periodically. Any thoughts? Keep up the great work, Mike. So I'll start with this, Mike. Typically, when you start looking at wanting to do that kind of backup, where you're not talking about just keeping files back up and the ability to recover from a catastrophic failure, when you're talking about, you're really talking about imaging. And when you talk about imaging, really the fastest thing that you can do, or the, the most efficient way to do that is with snapshots of some sort of another. Now you can do snapshots with LVM, you can do snapshots with ZFS, you can do snapshots by virtualizing your, uh, your physical hardware and running inside of a virtual environment and doing some of your work that way. All of those things will get you snapshotting. But I'll just pick one, uh, let's say ZFS, for example. If you were to run ZFS on your computer, you could run a, uh, a snapshot that, that takes a periodic snapshot, let's say every hour. And at any point in time, you hose your machine, you click on a snapshot, you roll back, and you're good to go. That has saved me numerous times when I go to do a failed update or when uh, Lightworks, <laughs> much as I love it, tends to have some interesting uh, conflicts sometimes. And there's some there's some hackery that you have to do to get it to work. And I've, I've had issues with that sometimes breaking other things with Pulse and, and Olsa and stuff like that. All of those things are easily recovered just by taking a snapshot before I try and make the change. If you're looking at the fastest way to constantly have your system, the ability to roll your system back to any particular time, snapshots definitely the way you want to go. Now, if you want to actually take a full image of the system, I'm not sure that there's going to be a great way to do that without powering the system down, without removing the flashcard. If you want, if you actually did want like an IMG file or an ISO, uh, that was the that was the disk image. The reason that is, you don't want to take those kinds of you don't want to like dd the drive for example while the drive is in use 
um, you would want to let everything unmount. You'd want everything to be closed and static. Snapshots are specifically designed to deal with that because they're designed to deal with the delta in the middle of a snapshot. You start taking a snapshot and a file changes. You know, as if a snapshot is going to know exactly how to deal with that. DD is not. So that would be my advice. Michael, Ryan, any thoughts? You know, for backups, I use Deja Dupe and you can select. I know it's just for individual files. Generally, people use it, but you, of course, can select everything to move over to the external drive, but you're not going to be able to just flash it right on like you're stating and, and start using it. So I think your solution is probably one of the better ones. And I'm trying to create a full system image. I usually use something like Clonezilla. I see people in our chat talking about time shift and mm-hmm. R clone. I think there's a lot of options here, but no, your solution is probably the best. Yeah. And also you can do uh, like time shift is a good option. It's a good, easy access to set up and you know, that kind of thing. It works on most distributions and I'm not sure if it works on a pie, but so I haven't looked into that, but I would say that in terms of a pie, I would make copies of the SD card just because the content on there is so small. It would be probably faster to do that than having that s- set up. Depends on how, how frequently he changes or how frequently he makes changes to the to the system, right? Yeah, that's true. If, if you're you know if you're working on something every day and and one thing or another is changing. Yeah, I was thinking of it more of like an appliance making. style. So maybe that's what like if you don't use it in appliance style, it would be a lot different. But if it is just an appliance, then it would be you know you wouldn't have to worry about making backups that often. Uh, but there's another option that Z- Noah loves because it's built in snapshotting, and that's ButterFS. Oh yeah, there you go. That would work perfectly that's, for everybody for- across the. You guys, did you miss the part in the email where he said he was concerned about losing data and wanted to back it up? Oh, now, wow. if the email wow. said, if the email said, Just, I have data that's not important and I really don't need it, and it doesn't really matter if it gets lost or not, then I would say, <laughs> Just don't FS use RAID 5 or 6 and you're good. Uh-huh. By the way, I just want to mention here that, you know, one of the advantages in Linux, period, has been the idea that when you are let's say setting up a new drive and you need to move your files over, you install the OS and you can move your files over and you can do this in an insanely little amount of time, 10, 15 minutes in some cases, depending on your system, without having to do keys and find out where all the product keys and call product support line because it says you've already used your key more than once and all the things that happen when you're doing this in a Windows system. And I've personally found I have no need anymore once I left Windows to have full image backups that I could flash right. onto another drive. Same. I just need my files and because, I move yeah. them over. To that point, Mike, what I would suggest, which may be a funner project for you, because I'm not sure doing whole system images is really that advantageous in Linux from a personal use perspective, is to go and look at my GitHub page. I have an auto install bash script that I wrote that people really have liked because it's a nice menu driven bash script. You can go in there and edit for the software you want, and you can actually create sections of it for your Raspberry Pi, for your desktop. And so if one of the things that takes you a long time is pulling down the software that you want, you could use this bash script, just keep it updated with the software you like to use. When you basically reload a Raspberry Pi or whatnot, you would run the bash script. It would have a menu for you that pops up as soon as you run it. You check all the things you want. It installs that. You also have your files that you pulled down that you are backing up from whatever file backup solution you want, like Deja Dupe or whatnot. And you've got everything running right there within minutes because the bash script is super fast. It's going to load all the programs you use on a regular basis there. And it's universal. You could use it in any package uh, that you want. So I think that would be a fun thing for you if you've never learned bash scripting to learn and would probably give you more advantage than even the system imaging. Yeah, that's a good point. So Anonymous writes us to say, Dear DLN host, I greatly appreciate the time and effort you put in delivering first-class experiencing hosting the DLN show. I think Noah will really like what I have to say about this. On episode 158, Hayden of Canonical stated EA Dice is a large consumer of WSL, Windows Subsystem or Linux, and that is true to some extent, but far from the entire truth. I know this is as I am one of the engineers that work on this. Now, yes, we did use WSL a bit, but that was due to EA's IT department forbid. Yes, you read that correctly. They forbid the use of any and all Linux clients on the internal networks. This was motivated by the fact, and this killed me, as somebody who's managed centers, massive centers for customer care, for collections, for IT. Hearing this, I was like, ew, because I've seen this before and it's just a morale killer. But He goes on to say, this was motivated by the fact that IT would not have any control over the machines, nor would they be able to install the standard 
EA overlords monitoring tools that log each and every keystroke and disk read write and OSC networking activities that occur on their machines. Could you imagine working for a company and they're like, hey, by the time, as soon as you start your shift, we're going to start recording every keystroke you make on your machine. It's this, this is the worst kind of management ever. And I have done where I've been brought in to turn around performance in organizations and teams over the years. I, I've done it even on 90-day rotation programs to turn around performance in organizations. And I could tell you one of the first things I do is look for crap like this and get it the heck out because you're getting 50% of your employees' capabilities when you lock them down into this prison-like environment where you're monitoring every single thing they do. But he goes on to say, as a rough performance comparison with old Windows Server builds and the new Linux builds, we could run up to five more servers on the same amount of hardware that one Windows Server instance needed before, which is pretty darn solid. Now, we did give WSL a try, but the performance for any type of FS access was not only poor, it was so bad that it just wasn't usable. And for the sake of being properly transparent, yes, some folks over at DICE use WSL to be able to run and debug the game servers on their Windows dev boxes, but that is a very limited number of devs. Most devs at DICE just don't want to touch the Linux server side of things anyway. So no worries in general. Us Linux-loving and freedom-loving devs did the hard work and well. Now all of us have left for other things, so good luck to them and all of that. And as for more examples where WSL is totally useless and just didn't get used, the backend folks creating web-based networking services, websites, and everything else around our games also deployed to Linux on AWS. Locally, they develop on Ubuntu Mate, running on VMware workstations. They have a really neat solution where they have a dev ready to go image being built and kept up to date. So anytime anyone happens to mess up the environment or a new developer joins, they can just copy the image and they're up and running in a few minutes. So all in all, WSL just isn't up to snuff and just isn't usable for anything professional or large scale, scale, no matter what Canonical or Microsoft says. So I do not feel worried about WSL being pushed out or marketed. Any dev doing anything of importance will just not be able to use it for anything useful anyway. Have a great one. And remember, the end destination will always be in a kernel panic. Regards. <laughs> so this is a really interesting... It, was, it broke our rule of being a short email, but it was so interesting to get an insider view on this. And I think we have to keep into consideration a couple of things real quick. WSL is a new product. So being that it may be, have some bugs and issues and doesn't work well now, they obviously have WSL 2 coming around the corner. I think there will be continued to be a lot of work going into WSL to improve some of the stuff that maybe make it worthless in some instances, as he stated today. But it is interesting that it wasn't. It's not as a of a big deal for companies. Not as an important deal for companies as some may have thought. It makes sense that you know if if w, this is all based on the WSL one, so it's if WSL two might improve some performance and stuff. But if people, if companies like this are using WSL and realizing that the current version that they're dealing with as the stable version is not usable. That might be a misstep from Microsoft going, you know, why would anybody try the second version if they already had such a bad experience? So maybe the WCL2 would be better, better performant or whatever, but it also might be too late for them to convince these companies to do it because they don't, they've already had such a horrible experience. It's interesting because the having this, this inside look into how they work and to have, have a dev let us know about the structure and this, like, I'm not surprised that EA has these keystroke not nightmare where they just track everything they do because it's EA and they often do things awful to the consumers. So it kind of makes sense that they're even their employees are getting, they do the same thing to their employees. <laughs> exactly. In our, in our opinion, that is. Yeah. 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 It's our, it's our opinion solely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Noah, the, what were your thoughts on this? What, you run a, you run a business. You could get so much more productivity of your employees. If yeah. you put cameras in their cars and have you know, cameras on them and monitor every single move, they you make. just log you know, everything. It's funny, they do. it's funny. You say that we looked into that at one time. I, I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy that went, hey, I have access to the firewall. I can figure out what people are going on the internet and how long they're spending doing it and what exactly they're doing down to every microsecond of the day. And then I can go yell at employees for doing that. And what I found was that I had this this weird problem where people quit every two weeks. It was crazy. It's amazing. And uh, yeah, it was incredible. I couldn't figure out what was going on. But no, in all seriousness, though, uh, it, it early on, I tried that. I tried really honing down and, and really trying to hold people down to, Hey, if you're on the clock, you're working. Cause that, you know, as a business owner and as, uh, uh, as a very straightforward person, that's just kind of how, I, that's how I view things. If I'm on the clock, I'm doing stuff. And what you find is that you don't want an employee businesses don't want employees. What they want is 
personal buy-in in a belief system and in a shared common goal and or mission. And so if our shared common goal and or mission is to provide other people with the technical solutions that they need to run their business or to be successful, then the way to get there the most efficiently and the, and the most effectively, and then quite honestly, the most cost effective way is to let people own their own job and owning their own job looks something like this. Hey, you come in the shop. Here are the list of things I expect you to get done by six o'clock PM tonight when we close. Now, if those things on that list are not done for any reason, you and I are going to sit down in my, in my office and we're going to have a conversation as to why those six things weren't done. And if the answer is something like, well, I tried to do this project, but we needed these parts. And so they're ordered and they'll be here tomorrow. That's perfectly fine. If the answer is, well, I, you know, I was going to get to it, but then I didn't really have time because I got in late this morning. And then, oh my gosh, my, you sound my, just like Michael. And then I don't know. I was going to get around to it. I just, I, I'll, I'll get to it. Some, okay. That's not going to work. Right. On the other hand, if all six things are done on the list and you banged out what I set aside for you for the entire day and you banged that out in three hours and then you sat in the, the shop and played Xbox and yes, there is an Xbox in the shop. Do I care? No, not really. As long as when the phone rings, it gets answered. As long as somebody has a problem, you get out there and fix it. As long as when we have things to do, they're getting done. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do in the in-between, right? Get your job done. And, and, and to that point, we have people that they don't ever come into the office. There are people that have never once set foot inside of Alta Speed Technologies, and yet they are some of the most valuable people that work for us. Why? Because they can do what they do just as effective from their bedroom as they could if I made them drive into the shop and sit at a desk with a suit and a tie and all, you know, it's just stupid. And it doesn't, and, and so they, they work in a more efficient environment and they work in a more efficient way. They're happier people. They're more willing to do stuff. They're willing to bend over backwards. And you're getting a hundred percent of them because believe it or not, I found in my years of management, people want to be loyal to the company they're working for. Yes. They want to, you actually have to force them not to be loyal by treating right. them like crap. So the first thing I do when they come in and they say, hey, Ryan, we need you to work on this organization. They have a 16% turnover, all these things. And I see something like this is I go and say, okay, let's get it installed on all the managers and directors' computers. That's right. And the managers and directors go, no, we don't We don't <laughs> want something that logs all of our keys. Then why are you yep. doing it to your employees? That's right. And that is the very thing. That's the moment where their eyes open up and go, oh, he was really going to put this on our machines. Yeah, it was. <laughs> And if you own it on your machine, <laughs> then you better take it off your employees' machines because we're going to get them on a, a mission path to say, this is where the company's going, this is where the organization's going, and this is how we're going to get there. And we're going to get more than 100% out of our employees because they want to be loyal and they want to work overtime and they actually want to be successful if you would let them, if you'd get out of their way. Right, and that's, right. that's a big part of being a good leader. But we just went into all the management practices and skipped over WSL. But the point is, I think WSL2 with the full Linux kernel is going to bring a lot of enhancements to the product. And while this is very interesting, and I'm so happy that he shared it with us because it was an interesting view into another company, I don't think that that puts WSL out of the running. I think it's just bugs need to be worked out still. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And especially the WSL2 and WSL1 is vastly different. I mean, the, the, the fact that it has the kernel actually in it the second time is, you know, you could tell it to be a lot better performant. Um, but at the same time, it is interesting to get the experience because, you know, we don't have experience with WSL that much anyway. So, and, you know, having someone who's dealt with it in that capacity is really interesting to get the inside. Yep. We love hearing from our worldwide community. We have so many ways for you to, vo to have your voice be heard. You can send us a short email or a video that may get incorporated into the show. Send your video links or emails to comments at Destination Linux. Dot org. So up first in the show this week, we have some really interesting news from the Ubuntu Chilin flavor, and th they are working on a new DE, or at least like modifying their existing DE, which is called UKUI. And this is interesting because they currently have a, a very Windows 7-ish style with their design, and it's a, currently built on Mate as the base. So they forked Mate which is kind of like a fork of GNOME 2 and like a continuation of GNOME 2. And so they have this interesting situation that they're changing from this Mate uh, base to a Qt based or a Qt based uh, approach. And they, you can see a, vi a video that preview. That should make you happy. Oh right? yeah, it already, oh, yeah, as soon as I saw that and it said Qt, I was like, yes, because it should be. <laughs> 
uh, because it's a better toolkit by far. And this, they have a video preview you can find in the link in the show notes that uh, is really cool. You can check out. It's more of it's more like a mock up style. It's not you can't use it right now. It's just it's just in the preview stages. But it is really interesting because there's uh, it's it's a really nice uh, design. Like I think it's a a mix between modern but still a classical traditional uh, paradigm. So I think it's quite good. And Deepin and the Ubuntu Chilean uh, developers really seem to have like a really good eye on polish. And they, they put a lot of effort into the design of the stuff that they make, which is really interesting because uh, Deepin is known for being like one of the most beautiful DEs and beautiful distributions available. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. So having the Ubuntu Chilean people also working on that kind of thing is a really cool thing to see. And also maybe there's possibilities of having some of the stuff built for UK UI with the cute based stuff to be ported to other cute based uh, just DEs. So I think this is a really cool idea. And so far the preview looks really good and I can't wait to try it out. So I tried this Ubuntu Ch- Chilean in its current format. And this is before the changes they're making. And I booted it in a VM. It's just, it's very, very slow. And I Mm -hmm. like the menu system because it's going to be familiar for anybody who comes from Windows 7. Uh, I don't know why the booting is so slow. could be a VM issue, could be anything else. But I can tell you that there's some exciting things there. And I'm very excited about what they're doing in this instance to modernize it. Because if you look at the video previews, the new menu system that they are implementing in the preview is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It very much reminds me, but in some ways much better than how Deepin puts all the polish in their system on their desktop environment. Uh, For instance, it's a standard menu with the options, very, very familiar to anybody who's used a menu system uh, since computers have started. But then on the very tip of the menu, there's an option that allows you to go into a GNOME dashboard-like view if you want it, which is kind of the perfect mix of both of those. Some people don't like dashboards, but there are times when that dashboard is advantageous. And by having it as just a little quick button at the top and boom, you get this gorgeous laid out dashboard, not like how KDE does it but actually a good-looking dashboard like Gnome does it. How okay, dare you? How, I'm, what, I'm kidding. It's what not are you good. on? So, like, so first of all, what, who has a problem with dashboards? Well, the KDE all, dashboard ta- menu system is a complete mess compared whoa, whoa, whoa. to... Whoa, whoa, whoa. As a KDE not. fanboy, that it's, it is kind of bad. Yes, absolutely. Uh, how, now, their menus how, well, are amazing. On. They have some of the best menus out there. I'm talking specifically the dashboard about their, itself. their dashboard menu. Yeah. So when, when like, you right-click on it, you go to click on alternatives, and then you click application dashboard right. instead of the yes. launch of the menu, right? right. The okay. way it's so what, organized what it and laid out looks like a complete mess. Well, the, the, it the, is, it's it's just basically a bigger menu. Like It's essentially just taking – the only thing they did on that is that they have a search at the top, and then they have the icon spread out with the categories on the right. But it's basically just the same regular right. menu, bigger. Well, and, what would you want? Well, I mean, the whole point Gnome. of having a dashboard is is changing the way it presents things. Like the way Gnome does, it, does. it is super different. Well, how? It sh- it, first of all, I can pin things to my to my or my recent application startup at the default, which is what you'd want. I can just start typing after I've opened the dashboard to get to get to. Yeah, but you can start typing on any of if the I menus. Want- it looks. Yeah, sloppy. I understand that, but that's the point. But, it looks but sloppy. But here's the thing. To me, the whole idea of the application dashboard is it takes over the entire screen because now the task is I'm searching for a file and or an application, right? And so presenting that over the display and getting getting that nice little smoke gradient going so it kind of takes my t- attention away from the task below and gives me an available list of the applications. I can search each application, click on all of them if I want to search through all of them, just start typing if I want to do that. The point Doc- isn't whether you can use it. The point is it's well, sloppy looking. When you do use it, it looks like, I don't remember because I haven't used it, but it, the, the icons in the menu weren't organized correctly. They were kind of sloppily all over the place, and maybe you could move them. There's, and then fa- there's having a favorites the, like, category, and then like, there's like the Michael said, search. where it's basically a gigantic menu, and it's not kind of redesigned in the dashboard format yeah. like it's, GNOME has. To me, makes it look sloppy. It feels like it's uh, the same menu, just disagree, bigger. But... It, like, it looks better than a basic menu because they put more polish in some places, like the the having the, the background, you know, uh, having a, a shader effect on the background is, is nice, but in terms of I mean, usability, 
it's just a bigger same menu. Because yes, the favorite section is there when you first start it up. Same thing if you use the regular kickoff menu. It doesn't change anything. And it's in this and if you do if you do the kicker menu, which is the smaller version, you actually have your categories and your favorites right next to each other. So it saves even more space. So as far as like they're they're essentially this all the same menu in the most ways just bigger and the dashboard with this UI demonstration is changing the way that it functions significantly compared to its rec- the smaller version yeah and so it's kind of like doing a hybrid approach where if if you look at I've had most people say that they they would they wish that the dashboard was more than just a menu in the plasma thing because like there's there is a plugin that someone made that's called a K, Kwin overview it's on mm-hmm. GitHub, and it uh, basically creates a plasma form style dashboard that uh, looks like the GNOME style. It's not exactly, but it has like the window display, and it has like the workspace visibility and stuff like that. So I think that would be a better well, approach would, to the dashboard. I mean, I, again, I mean, we shouldn't get too far distracted in this, side, but I guess we can just agree to disagree. But why, why, why would I want? to start getting into workspaces from my application launcher like that. That's the kind of stuff about gnome that, that like drove me nuts. Like I, I open up, I click on the, I, I hit the start menu or not the start menu, but I push the super key so that I can get uh, to launch an application. All of a sudden it is, you know, cascading my workspace and <laughs> all of the applications that are there. And this doesn't answer your question, Noah, but I'm just laughing because there is a Twitter post out there where somebody's like, Hey, show me your gnome extensions that you use for gnome. And these, a lot of the individuals I saw posting were big GNOME fans. And, and then you go in their extensions, they've got 10 to 15 to 20 extensions just to make that's the only way desktop use GNOME. work yeah, right, correctly. Yeah. And I and was dying link. because I and was waiting here, for somebody to post and go, I don't use any extensions because it's perfect out of the box. But And so to your point, Ryan, yeah. when you, uh, I, I asked somebody uh, that, that worked on the GNOME project about that and their answer was, well, of course, that's the way GNOME's designed. Yeah, of course. We don't, we don't put any functionality into it and you just, you do everything with extensions. That's the way it is. It's an extensible, I'm like, oh, brilliant. That makes sense. It's it's a workstation uh, desktop environment it, for me. But anyways, if you go and look at this link here, I'll get a lot of mail for that one. If you look at this link here and go to the 33 second mark, Noah, it's really interesting to see their dashboard. And if you would take a look, I'd be interested to know yeah. your thoughts comparing KDE to what they've implemented here in their dashboard view. Since you have the KDE menu right now. I do wish the dashboard. Yeah, not going to lie. I'm not seeing much of a difference, man. Are we talking about the same KDE menu thing? Because like these, hold on. I'm going to open it up here. I'm put this on this screen. I'm going to open this one on this screen. All right. So search, type to search. Those are the same. The way it's organized, the, categories the way on the, the, the icons then the categories are, are on the left the and the categories are on the right. Really? I, I honestly, man, I'm looking at them side by side. And I, I don't, you might like, be right. I haven't tried it's it. It's literally the categories is on the KD left KD side on, on this, on, on, on the one that you sent. And Katie has it on the right side. And other than that, to so, me, the KDE one looks actually more usable. Okay. So here's the difference. The KD- this is what KDE has always looked like. Oh, this is good. Make sure to record this. And Michael's going to crap on KDE. This is going to be good. Uh, so the difference between the Plasma version and this version, this UK UI thing, is that the Plasma version is kind of like taking the idea, getting it set, and then be done with it. You know, the, this one's more of like they've put more effort into the polish. So like it looks like when you have the KDE version, the Plasma uh, dashboard looks like it's a lot of wasted space. It starts with a, like with a couple applications that are displayed. It's not that much. It's not showing the things. You have to go to the different applic- different categories to get to the stuff. Whereas this one seems like it has everything set up by default, and you just choose which one you want. And and there is a way. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I, if I wanted to see all of the applications, I would just no, go to a regular traditional launcher. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have a favorite section at the top of this. You could still have a, let's say it says internet, social, and it keeps going. But you could have a favorites list on the exact same way in the top that takes up the same space but doesn't waste any of the rest of it so you don't have to go to the rest of it you could just scroll down so like there Mm -hmm. is a a a more polished effort into this and also they have organization and stuff on the right side where it has alphabetical stuff uh, category based stuff most common stuff they have also the most recent options that like this has more effort done into it than the way that plasma does it's just it's just better to polished It's, it's very similar yes but better polished. And one of the things that I don't like about the dashboard, and it's silly, I understand it, but it shows the the version, the difference between polish and function. If you look at the difference between when you have the dashboard versus this, they have a nice polished search box that is very obvious to what it's for. And then you have Plasma's type to search 
gigantic text at the very top. And it's just like, it's, it shows you the level it's of yelling at you. I love yes. how it's typed yeah. as arch. Yeah. It's, it's, it just shows you the, the effort they put into the polish of it versus just the functionality. I, the, here's the thing. I have never like read it for instructions. I hit the super key and I start typing my search and immediately. The yeah. But cause you already know it does that. I'm saying like, and you're presenting it to someone who's never seen this experience before you would, you want to present it in a way that's more clean, more clean to design and more polished to them. And a search box that they see on everywhere is way better than just giant text, essentially yelling at them about well, to search. Good thing in you Linux so? is we have choice and Noah can stick with his inferior dashboard and everybody else yes. can use the much superior <laughs> dashboard. No, all I'm saying is that Don't I want that. Plasmo to make a better dashboard. That's all I'm saying. Or adopt the one that I'm talking about because I like the other overview thing too. It's just... Well, since this is cute, know, they can basically take the code from this and, and yeah, clean theirs up. In theory, quite possible. I, I think I think that the best thing about these uh, distributions switching to Qt is mean there's more... Like, you know, there's a long... There was an argument a long time ago about, you know, GTK versus Qt, and it was always like, well, there's more GTK desktops. That's not necessarily true anymore. Like, there, it used to be like it was everything versus KDE. Now there's Deepin, now there's UKUI, there's the LXQ team, there's Lumina, there's a quite a few now that are Qt based, so it's basically 50-50 at this point. And I'm I'm excited for the, you know, the era of Qt being recognized for what it is, the better toolkit. Wow. What? It's just my opinion, but also fact. So a really popular topic happening right now is Elementary has announced that they are going to reinvent the way developers get paid for their apps once again. So Daniel Foray and the elementary team have launched an Indiegogo fundraiser to usher in the next evolution of the App Center. The issues they're looking to solve include apps currently unconfined, raises potential security and privacy issues, as well as the ability for poor coding to impact system stability. Today, apps go through automated testing, but things can be missed, and it takes a while to get new applications into production. Apps require updated components, but the distro release cycle is too slow. That's a common complaint I give all the time. Entering payment details for each app you want to donate to is tedious. So we know that Elementary is one of the first mainstream distros to go in there and create a system for you to easily donate to developers out there. That was their first iteration. Now they're still looking at the entire Linux ecosystem and saying, how can we have a bigger impact with the work that we've done here in elementary and help it translate into other distros as well? So the team is looking to solve these issues for everyone and make their app center available to any distro that wants to use it with a focus on flat packs. This means compatibility across all of the distro sphere, much like we were talking about earlier in the episode. They're looking to raise $10,000 in total, and they're about darn near there already of reaching their goal um, to do an in-person sprint with the developers that they've set up here. There's a team of six experts across the desktop engineering and web design sphere. Uh, at the day that I wrote this article, it was $4,880. So nearly half of it was raised. I think it's even uh, much higher than that today. It looks yeah, like it's over 8, 75%. 000. Yeah. Yeah, eight thousand dollars. So it looks like they're going to hit their goal very easily and in just a few days. So a lot of people very interested in this. It's a very innovative approach, in my opinion, to getting devs paid for their work. This is something that I think everybody is starting to realize is a major issue in Linux. The free thing that people misunderstood has had a major impact on the progress we can make in software in Linux because somebody working their full regular job and then coming home and supporting millions of users or thousands of users who are using their application, yelling at them for bugs, just doesn't seem to be the right way. If somebody's app takes off, we need to find ways that they can make a living off of it. And we know clearly, just based on this Indiegogo campaign, the Linux community is willing to put money out there to help. We just need to make a system that is very simple and easy for people to donate and to remember to donate. The only issue I see here, and I think this is a fantastic task, and I think having an in-person sprint is very important. I do that with my own teams, and you get a lot more done than on conferences and video, which is primarily how I have to interact with my team because they're spread out all over the United States. But when you do have those in-person contact and you do have a specific mission you're trying to launch, 
It's very valuable. You can get a lot more done within that time. So I think what they're doing here is very important. The only thing I think that we're missing here, let's say this takes off, and I hope it does, is how do you get money for the devs who are working on all the important backend processes that aren't necessarily, and maybe all the apps are using it, but it's not necessarily something in your face that you're realizing that all of these apps rely on to actually function properly that you're not going to get a donation for because there seems to be still a gap here in that system. And mm. I'm just wondering if there's something they could do for those developers that do a lot of the backend processes that are just as critical to Linux. I mean, you would, you would think that maybe the developers of those applications would take a percentage of what they're getting and give it to the people who they depend on. But I guess, I mean, it's way well, more difficult to do that though. I, I don't know if that's true. If you look at it, that may be true for, you know, the day-to-day -day users. So like, you know, the people who use uh, GIMP, for example, were more likely to donate to GIMP because they're using GIMP. And so that's very hard to then have them donate to the X project, even though they need or Wayland or whatever, because they rely on that backend service in order to use GIMP. But I think that at the same time, you're going to have large companies that depend on you know, OpenVPN, for example, right? Or uh, what? What are some other like major SSL? Uh, you know, these kind of those kind of like widespread technologies that right now there is no there is no track for a corporate environment or for a business to donate because at the end of the day, you know, they they they're trying to get expenses down as much as possible. So you go to a, you know you 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 submit a purchase request to to send some money to a company and they go, why are we sending money to this company? Well, because we depend on their service. Did they ask us for it? No, we just feel like we should you know, give back to the community. This is something that does not go over well in corporate America. Whereas when you start having a strategy and you start having a, a you know, a, a process to follow, now all of a sudden that process could absolutely be used for larger companies, I think, to give back to some of those back-end things that aren't necessarily in the limelight, don't get a lot of shining glitter, but at the same time are very necessary and relied upon projects. No, I agree with that completely. I'm just mean that you know, there's not a, pl a platform for that. So like, for example, these, at these developers who are getting the percentage from the App Center might be able to s take that percentage a little bit and give it to the people they depend on. But it's going to sure. be... So we know. have a strong evidence to suggest that this is, that both, both uh, people on both sides of the equation app developers that want to get paid for the work and people that want to pay app developers for their work both agree that that this is probably a likely thing how hard is it really to extend this same model to some of those back-end services hey you know so maybe it doesn't show up in an app center maybe it shows up in in you know in in some other form but I, you know the same idea can simply be you know take yeah, the yeah. same coding the same idea the same concept and, and i think that's my point is that's the only people we're missing here i love this idea and i think somehow if we can extend it to the back end as well, we can really kind of solve or start solving this problem that we have where developers are not getting paid for the incredible amount of work that they're doing, regardless of how popular their application is becoming. And yes, the Linux community, there's so many of them out there that are extremely giving and, and purposely go out there and look for applications that they're using and donating to them and everything else. But so I think this solves that. I just, I think there, if they could add something in the sprint for the back end developers, you would have nearly. Yeah a pretty perfect model for what they're trying to accomplish here. I mean, that, that would be awesome. I, I think that's a great point. If they, if they could somehow, you know, as take this as a suggestion to add to their sprint to, or at least to for their roadmap at some point to do something like that, I think that would be a fantastic addition. But and, kudos to them for taking on yeah. this challenge. I think it's something that has been desperately needed to fix and they're the ones yep, out there absolutely. going to take it. I did find it interesting that elementary being based on Ubuntu is going the flat pack route and not the snap route was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, I think it they kind of yeah. want to do it for the fact that, that they they said that they're making the App Center support be able to be used in other distributions and also the backend stuff would be possible to use in other distributions as well. So maybe because of that, snaps are universal, but they're not, I guess they're not as universally accepted as flat packs are have become. Uh, but I agree that I think that the, for the best overall solution for this problem, if App Center didn't care which package you used it would be better so if if you ha if they were provided a way to get payments to people who used app images snaps and flat packs it would become it would be like probably the best option possible like i want a store to exist like that not necessarily just to give access but to provide abilities for people no matter what format they use to ha to get uh, you know the developers to be able to get the money from the users and the users be able to pay for the things that they like 
I think that it would be amazing. Like maybe this is the first step to that. Uh, but you know, having the flat packs built into it, and that it's that's great that they're doing that because there's a lot of great flat pack options and a lot of and having the flat hub being a part of the 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 sprint is that they said uh, Cassidy said that that's what they're trying to do to have flat pack and have flat hub and have all these people work on the sprint together to make this possible. That's awesome. Uh, but it would be it would be amazing if it had the other formats included too. So maybe down the long down the road they could do that. We'll see. But I think this is a great first step anyway. So I'm glad that they're taking the effort to make this happen. Yep, absolutely. One of the reasons I was so excited for the Pine Book Pro to come out was because I've always dreamed of being able to take a Raspberry Pi with me. ARM is one of the most exciting architectures out there and competitor to Intel, given the the less power requirements and the, the cheaper chips and all of those kinds of things. Well, it turns out there is no end to the use for case of the Raspberry Pi and the company Gumsticks just created a whole new range of projects for you to try. So for 50 bucks, you can get an add-on module for the Pi Zero, Pi Zero W that adds a battery pack to make it mobile. With just two AA's, you can get two hours of battery life, and then you can even recharge them on the go for the Pi micro USB part for more time. In addition, it adds an accelerometer and two-axis gyroscope. So if you like to hack around and you'd like to try the Gumstick Geopetto, Geppetto online drag and drop board development service to unlock more features. Some of the use cases might include things like a portable Kali pen testing system or a wireless video streaming system. It's amazing to see all the add-ons and support for the Raspberry Pi, which continues to be a draw for the wider Linux community. This is one of those projects that makes technology accessible for anybody because the ham radio operators of the world, right, the second that Pi came out, the first generation Raspberry Pi, we had, do I have one sitting next to me that I can grab? I don't. We have small little batteries battery packs that, uh, you know, Batteries Plus and, and various different places uh, sell for use in fire alarm systems, burglar alarm systems, security systems, the little exit signs. If you ever see the lights come on, those little batteries are fantastic for doing stuff like this. And of course, uh, it didn't take me long to wire up a deal where I could plug that into the Raspberry Pi and then run my Raspberry Pi. And then, of course, people have added solar panels to recharge those mm -hmm. batteries. The yep. problem with those solutions is this. You have to know what Anderson power poles are. You have to know to a certain degree how to solder, at least how to crimp connectors on. You have to know how to use step down voltage so that you can convert a 12 volt battery down to a 5.5 volt. Uh, uh, those are all skills that you have to know. The nice thing about this device is it lets you take AA batteries, which you buy at local Wally World, and you throw them into your Raspberry Pi. And now your Raspberry Pi functions just like your television remote, right? Grandpa can do it. And that kind of stuff, allowing people to take this technology on the go, so that they're able to use the Raspberry Pi anywhere makes it possible for you to take your Raspberry Pi over to your parents' house or to your grandparents' house who have never seen such a device and say, hey, look at this. So just without plugging anything in or connecting to anything, just, hey, look what we can do. It allows you to play with it out in the field and, and provide some interesting opportunities for outdoor use and monitoring use and collection of data, all of those things. So very, very, very cool. Something I very much have on my want list and will order and check out and, and touch back on because... Uh, this is pretty cool. What do you guys think? I love this. You know, I was thinking when I saw this that if you think about hardware impact on Linux, can you think of a device that has brought more people universally to Linux than Absolutely the Raspberry not. Pi? Absolutely it has not. Had fact, the I said, biggest impact. I said that on Ask Noah on Tuesday. I said, I... I really question, I would love to talk to some of these ARM people that have told me, or oh, not a tool for somebody who uh, really understands ARM infrastructure. It's really more just for tinkering and toying around with. I don't believe that's true anymore. You know, I, I have I know I just for ordered... a fact major corporations, massive oh, yeah. billion dollar companies that deploy Raspberry Pi you... on a regular basis throughout their networks that run major infrastructure for the Viewsonic, country. So it's a big Usonic thin client based on the Raspberry Pi. The uh, N, N Computing's new thin client based on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, thin Links based on the Raspberry Pi. I can't remember the display uh, Yodak display solutions uh, uh, based on the Raspberry Pi. There is a, a, bio, uh, a biomedical company that makes um, like artificial legs that are powered by the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I, I can, uh, our company uses them so frequently that we actually, we have, I, have to, I had to pay a guy. We have a part-time guy that now comes in and he takes the flirt cases, which if you're not using the Raspberry 
Raspberry Pi uh, with the flirt case, then you're doing it wrong. Um, and he <laughs> combines the Raspberry Pi flirt awesome. case with the Raspberry Pi. And then we set a couple of them up as camera streamers. We set a couple of them up as Volumio boxes. We set, I mean, all these different things. And he sets them out, puts them, repackages them, labels them. Uh, and and prices them and puts them out for sale because we go through so many of them for so many different things. They're they're literally a staple of the industry, and so a, as you watch that occur, I have to ask myself, you know, to your point, how, can you think of another hardware device that has changed the landscape? I can't think of a device that has changed the landscape in technology as much as the Raspberry Pi has. My God, man, everybody can have access to these things and everybody can use them for whatever it is that they want to do. And this means that people are building garage door openers that are built up the Raspberry Pi home automation that's based off the Raspberry Pi. If you use uh, what is a home assistant, uh, by default, it comes as, a, as an image for the Raspberry Pi. I mean, these are things that just wouldn't exist otherwise. So I, I think yeah, it's done think, more to get users on Linux than anything yes, else absolutely. I can think of. It's just, you know, and you, getting you, comfortable with flashing and the tools on Linux. You look yeah. at something like Android and people will always use that as, hey, everybody uses Linux. If you use Android, because Android is such a dominant force, a lot of people have Android phones, but it doesn't represent to me anything that Linux represents. It doesn't represent the privacy in Linux, doesn't represent the security we expect in Linux, doesn't represent any of that. But the Raspberry Pi represents all of that, in, in my opinion. And people know they're using Linux. They know they're downloading Linux. They know they're using open source applications when they're using it. It's not like Android where it's hidden and you tell people and their eyes get big and go, really? I've been using Linux the whole time? Use a Raspberry Pi, you know Linux. It's, it's just one of the best things that's happened to our community ever. Yeah, and you can also have like there's you can interface them with other things, the other devices, and now now like there's even times where uh, our local Linux user group there was someone who brought their kid in, and their kids are using Linux by by doing the Raspberry Pi and learning Python and stuff like that with it, and it's just a fantastic device. And prior to existence of the Raspberry Pi. People have always wanted something like that. It was like an int- an easy entry level device that will allow you to get to, you know trying to use Linux, but you're also being doing it very cheaply. You don't have to use existing hardware and that kind of thing. And I would say that the Raspberry Pi has changed. I don't know, like every aspect of technology at this point because there's been so many competitors. And even if you take that, like there's some competitors that are better, like better p- priced, uh, they're h- more powerful hardware and like that kind of stuff. It's it definitely has like a it's changed the landscape of technology to the point where I don't it's just giving so much to the possibilities of people, you know, being able to build their own like, you know, Ryan has that screenly thing set up with it. Like there's so many yep. things you could build that you couldn't prior to that or like you would have to devote it's a lot of money on the to back it. of the TV. Like it's yeah. so simple. It's just the easiest little device to deploy yeah. it solves my problems with the iphone i talked about earlier of moving pictures and things over it's it solves every problem that i have it's just so easy to think okay i probably can solve it with the raspberry pi and it's so portable i can bring it anywhere i can move it to any station it doesn't take up any space and the biggest problem yeah. with raspberry pi i'm going to tell you right off the bat if you're listening to this and you're like okay finally they've talked me into getting one of these is this it's like a Lay's potato chip where you can't eat only one. Well, you can't buy only one yeah, Raspberry yeah. Pi. You might Boy, as well get a kit truth. of seven of them because by the time you're done, you're going to have seven different projects where you're going to need one for it. Yeah, and also now they're having this this new portable battery pack solution where you can just get average batteries that you can get from anywhere and even get like rechargeable stuff so you can have like a rechargeable set of batteries that you can just you know crank out for a portable solution. Like the only thing that I always, always that I always felt was negative about the Raspberry Pi for me was that it was it's locked down to different places like whether you had the Ethernet it didn't have Wi Fi built in. Now it has Wi Fi built in. And then the only thing it didn't have was a portable power solution. And now with this add on you can have the, like it just changes the it allow it allows you to take Raspberry Pi even further than it already was. So I think this is awesome. But to your point, I do want to try some of the other brands out there. I know there's a a bunch of different ones, but Pine actually has their own version of this. And I do want to play around with those. I think the problem with anybody competing in this arena is Raspberry Pi is so dominant. When you talk about support and applications and things getting running on them, you're going to have a megaton in the Raspberry Pi. And I'm not sure what the support level is. I imagine there's a lot of universal things, but for some of these other boards out there. Yeah, there's definitely there's there's and also I think the main thing is that there's more power in these other ones like the new Hard Rock 64 from Pine 64. Like there's a lot more uh, power available to you at a cheaper cost in some cases, whereas mm-hmm. you're 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 still 
with the Raspberry Pi, you get the benefit of it being more of a universal uh, used device. And th I think that's like kind of the only negative to ARM is that if you build for something for ARM that's on one particular product, it doesn't mean it works on another another product and you have to port it to the other one. So like True. that's the only thing I can think of that ARM has an issue really with. But uh, there's we've we've before Raspberry Pi, before all these boards, before all of this stuff with ARM, we were in a state where you know you couldn't do as much, you couldn't get, as, it wasn't as flexible. And now we're in a position where we can do so much with so little and so low cost devices that this is like we're in an awesome state for getting people to Linux, getting to try Linux. Even learning programming has been a lot easier. Talk now. about being late to the game that some distros just last year announced. Hey, we're officially making our stuff ready for Raspberry Pi. Like, welcome <laughs> five years later to yeah, the party. Exactly. <laughs> uh, should have been there a long time ago. So up next in the show, we're going to talk about something that's interesting that we discussed uh, on a previous episode of Hardware Addicts. We talked about cloud gaming services and that kind of thing and the hardware behind them. And one of those popular services we talked about is NVIDIA's GeForce Now. And this is an interesting situation because NVIDIA has been known as being like, you know, very helpful to the Linux community and people defend the Linux community and people in the Linux community defend NVIDIA a lot when we talk about how AMD is better and all that stuff. And, you know, it's they have valid points that NVIDIA does has been around for a very long time in the community. And, you know, we t mostly talk about the proprietary versus open source aspects between AMD and NVIDIA. But now we're talking about NVIDIA's GeForce because it doesn't work on Linux, or at least not for now. They wait, wait a minute. So you're telling me there's a universal gaming platform out there that the whole purpose of a cloud gaming platform is to so any device anywhere can run it and NVIDIA takes theirs out of beta and it doesn't work for Linux. Right. They basically okay, so it doesn't work for Mac either, probably, right? No, it works for Mac uh, too. Uh, it doesn't work for Windows. It does work for Windows. What about Android? It does work for Android. But not Linux. But not Linux. It doesn't but work Nvidia on Nvidia loves Linux, right? I, yeah. They, they like they love them. Yeah. Oh, apparently. Just, just apparently. checking. Yeah. The, the only thing it doesn't work with oh. iOS either. So I guess there is that. But at the same time, it's kind of interesting that, you know, in, Nvidia is like it's just annoying that Nvidia does these things like, you know, they, they they talk about we, you know, for a long time they've been supporting Linux and it's been great when they when they were supporting cuz like, you know, 10 years ago and uh, AMD was just garbage on Linux. So it was it's it true. was it was really great to have Nvidia. But now we're at a situation where in, it's completely switched where in, AMD is doing way more for Linux. Well, and, look, Michael, this but, is the thing. I'm, I'm going to come in here and defend NVIDIA. I've I'm, got I'm not this, go, this I'm is... not going to bash NVIDIA either. I still have something nice to say about okay, it. It's right, just, but uh, it's just like I do like the fact that they're do, what they're doing is an interesting concept in comparison to the other gaming platforms or cloud gaming platforms. It's just I wish they would let me use it. Well, the, here's the thing. This is a new product, and certainly it's going to. Oh wait, it's been in beta for five years. Never mind. Um, <laughs> ooh. Uh, so um, yeah, I guess there's that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the good news is though the one thing they did do cool here on this platform, and all joking aside, I hope Nvidia fixes this because it almost seems like you would have to on purpose not make it work for Linux if it works everything else and it's a cloud-based platform. I mean, I'm not saying that's what they did. But it's just weird after five years of being in beta and then you launch it that it doesn't work in Linux, but it works in every other operating system. Uh, just kind of odd to me. But like, I don't even think Google Stadia was made to work on Linux, for instance. It just did because it works through the browser. So it just works. So how do you not have Linux support? I, I don't even know how you do that. But the cool thing about what they're trying to attempt here is that if you have games, like Michael was saying, in Steam, for instance, unlike Google Stadia, where you have to rebuy every game in Stadia, and then you have a platform that they're likely, in my opinion, to close down probably because that's what, in my opinion, Google does all the time, then with their services, you don't, if you, you're going to lose all those games. Whereas this one, if you have the games in Steam and it's licensed in NVIDIA, meaning they have a license where they could sell it, then you can play that game right from the cloud without rebuying it. So you still own your game if, let's say, the service went away in the future, which is a really cool thing that they did here. I just, for the life of me, have no idea why it doesn't work in Linux. Yeah, it's just, it's annoying that they can't let us use it because it's, you know, the whole point of the cloud gaming is to bring gaming to places that you couldn't normally have it in some cases where, you know, like that's what Proton's for and that's what all these other things are for. And then, you know, you make it for Android 
and you make it for Windows, which already has the ability in to Mac. play those games with the Windows in Mac. I mean, Mac is in the in a, is in a similar situation, just not as bad, you know, in that situation because they there are some games that do support Mac, but like you know, it's it's kind of weird that they're making a cloud gaming platform where you could play everywhere except the places that you could already play them is where you could play them, you know. And so it's kind of weird that they don't include Linux because that's that would be one of the main things. Like Nvidia would get so much bonus points from the you know the, the Linux community. Imagine how we would have introduced you know? this article had they done it correctly. Oh yeah, if they had already had supported Linux, we would have been like mate, you know, Team Green, you know, versus AMD, you know, Team Green versus Team Red. It's kind of like I would have probably put green stuff all over my room if that article was different. In yeah, your it'd be to- your room would be totally different from what it is now. And yeah. uh, <laughs> but I think it'd be great if they were to do that. And if they were, we'd have introduced this topic in a sense of like, hey, you know, we 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 like AMD, but you know, great job to Nvidia. But that's didn't that didn't happen. And I and, and, the, and the sad thing about it not happening is that every other aspect of this service sounds awesome. Great. Like yeah. yeah, they they allow you to use the games you already exist, play against people you already exist with the same Steam friends and the same uh, you know everything that's related to Valve gaming, and then you also have support for like Origin, some others in like uh, app store or game stores in uh, this service. So they have like five hundred games you can already play with, and and the, and the One price of our is patrons reasonable. Wants to know, Michael, did Epic buy Nvidia? That would that that would explain why it doesn't support Linux, but I don't think so. I don't not at this particular case. It would explain everything, but no. Uh, but I think that it's 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 just unfortunate. And reason we're ta- giving them a hard time is because they're doing what we want, but not allowing us to use it. And that's what bothers me about it. Because I love the idea of having the games you already played. Uh, you know the games that you have you can get from a Windows thing and you play them we're in Linux. We're encouraging uh, them through a awesome. verbal beatdown is what we're doing. Yes, we want you to bring it to us and we will applaud you when you do. We're just giving you a hard time because until you then have we're it. gonna bop you on top of the head a couple right. times. And they, in theory, they said that Chrome will Chrome browsers, which I mean, I don't like the fact that they're using Chrome as like a dependency because they, I mean, gross. You know, whatever. But in theory, when they do bring it to Chrome, that it is possible they'll bring it to Linux by default, like without, you know, trying to do that. But uh, oops, we provided Linux support. Our bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We didn't mean to do that. So perfect. Uh, but it'd be great when it happens because I think their service is pretty cool and the prices are reasonable. Like right now, it's like $5 a month or something. And uh, they said that after the Founders Edition is over, it's going to be like $10 a month or something like that. Like there's a, like, I, I think it's way more reasonable for you you buy the game on the platform you want to play it on, and then if you want to add a cloud gaming aspects to it, you can use this to do that. That sounds awesome, because if maybe at some point you don't want to use their cloud gaming, you could still play the game, unlike maybe Stadia. Maybe our friends at Canonical who have a good relationship with NVIDIA could put a little bug in their ear for us and say, hey, mind making this thing work with Linux? That yeah, that's great. a good idea. That's a good idea. This software spotlight is really, I want to bring attention to this project because I think it needs some help. And I think it's also a really cool platform. The platform is called Media Goblin. It's a decentralized alternative to services like Flickr, YouTube, and SoundCloud. It's self-hosted. It can be run through Docker, so very easy to set up. And most importantly, it's completely open source. The tool looks like it needs support, though, because if you go and you go to their pages, they have a couple options like an up-to-date version via Docker, but the PAAS version is currently out of date and they're looking for help from the community to get it updated. Again, additionally on the side, it says, hey, use Sandstorm if you kind of want to pay for a self-hosted version where you don't have to set up yourself, but then you go to Sandstorm and it looks like they're shutting down their paid option there that included Media Goblin. So I think it needs some support. It's probably people aren't talking about it, but this is not something where you want to share private videos and things like that, like we have Nextcloud or others. This is if you're wanting to maybe put content out there for patrons. Maybe you want to put videos and things that everybody can enjoy, but you don't want to use services like YouTube or Flickr or SoundCloud to distribute. Then this is where you would self-host on Media Goblin to get your content out there. And I did set up one through Docker. It was very easy to get rolling and, and, and get it going. And I thought, what a great perk possibly for my patrons um, to have some of the videos and things that they can digest right there from that tool. So something I'll be looking into in the future. But if you've not checked out Media Goblin, I think it's a pretty cool little piece of software. 
Our tip and trick this week is the ls login command. You can use ls logins to get basic information on the system's users. Perhaps you've created some logins in the past that you no longer need, or maybe you just want to quickly see who you set up to access on the system. Just type in ls logins in the terminal or use ls logins tag g to get a list of groups the users are a part of. Very nice. A big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. If you want a behind-the-scenes pass into the making of the show and an opportunity to chat with us live, consider becoming a patron. Our patrons help keep the show going and get perks like access to the live recordings and unedited versions of the show. The best part is you can join for just a few dollars on Patreon or sponsors. Destination Linux also offers a great way for you to become a part of the community by going to destinationlinux.network and joining the forums. Discussion on the on about the shows, the network, along with all of the listeners from around the world, all in one place. If you're looking for a more live chat sessions, you can join us on our interactive Telegram group, where we have over 1,200 members interacting with one another and sharing their passion for Linux. Head over to destinationlinux.network to learn more. We love hearing from you, so please get back to us and provide us feedback or ask any burning questions you have about the episodes. Send video links or comments to our email address at comments at destinationlinux.org. Please try to keep the comments brief as we may include them in a future episode of the show. Also, do not forget to go to the DLN store and pick up some of the greatest swag out there from across our network of podcasts and shows. We have limited edition design that shows off all the founding shows on Destination Linux Network, which you can pick up so you can support every show at once with a coffee mug, a hoodie, or a t-shirt, or you can grab yourself individual uh, shows that you like, like Ask Noah's show, grab yourself a t-shirt from there, maybe a mug, and you'll be able to basically have a life-changing experience by wearing the swag from some of the greatest podcasts ever made. Absolutely. And if you want some more content, the fun doesn't stop here. We also have our own channels that you can check out and you can check out Ryan. Okay, wait a minute. There's a, this stool thing has gotten just a little bit ridiculous, but I'm going to just embrace it for this particular outro. So Ryan can be found on YouTube, but you can go to this website domain by going to fillmystool.com where he'll fill your brains on hardware, software, and all things Linux. You can find my content by going to tuxmystool.com. And where I do an in-depth weekly Linux news podcast, This Week in Linux, and other Linux-related content. And you can check out Noah's content by going to linuxstool.com. Noah hosts a weekly talk radio show, apparently called Linux Stool, uh, at 6 p.m. Central. It's not about stools. We don't talk about stools. We don't have any stools. We sit on chairs because we like to sit. We know what we like to do. <laughs> so you got to go to asknoahstool.com. And this no, you a, just go to linuxstool.com. Okay, sure. Like 6 p.m. Central on Tuesdays, where you can join him and ask answer all your Linux and tech questions by going to linuxstool.com. And uh, make sure to check out all the other Linux Destination Linux Network shows by going to destinationlinux.network. You can find things like Hardware Addicts, Linux for Everyone, DLN Extend, and more. So yeah, everybody check those out. Go ahead and go to destinationlinux.network. Why can't we have destinationlinux.stool? There to fill the network. I'm need. pretty sure that's not a TLD option, but I'll look into it. Checking for stool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. Should have been as a stool. <laughs> 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 <laughs>